here today. So I'm going to go ahead and start recording. Um, welcome to our April Advisor Network meeting, NSO Prep. So um, just a quick um, overview of our agenda today. Um, so of course, um, please grab lunch if you would like. And then I'm going to introduce myself and then go over um, uh, some of the folks that we're going to be hearing from today. So my name is McKay. For those of you who I haven't met yet, um, I am the advising and academic success strategist, and I'm super pleased that everyone is here today. So um, today's mission really is to hear some important updates for, our, for NSO, right? We know that NSO is going to begin in June, on June the 8th. Um, and I want to have a disclaimer that I know that there's so much information that goes into NSO, and so there's not possibly a way for us to go over all of that in person today. And so I'm going to kind of give you guys an overview of the strategy that we are going to have for information sharing over the summer. But today in person, we have Dr. Angela Vaughn, who's here to talk to us about University 101, um, students who are going to be required to take that course and the different offerings available. And I think a little bit more about the philosophy behind University 101. So for our newer colleagues, this is great for you to learn about. And then for us veterans, um, it's going to be a nice refresher. Um, we also are going to hear from Dr. Tara Wood about DSP and written communication processes. Um, she's created a wonderful one-pager for us, which is my hope for all of our resources. We'll have a one-pager in the NSO guide that I will be preparing. And then uh, Jacob Sutton from, N from NSO, from Ames to UNC, will be giving us a cohort update, which I'm really excited about. And then finally, our colleagues from Office of the Registrar are here. And then we will just have round table. If anybody has updates that they want to share from their department, we would love to hear about that. And then we are going to cap off with a celebration and acknowledgement of our colleagues who have made progress in completing the call to adventure advisor training and um, give out some certificates. So with that being said, um, let's go ahead and go over a little bit of information. So I do have on this um, slide deck, our NSO dates. Um, I'm sure you all got the info that our May 12th NSO has been canceled. And so this is our um, kind of slate uh, of NSOs uh, moving forward. And so the majority of them are going to be first time, first year focused. Um, but we do have a couple of special student population ones later in the summer that you should be um, looking out for. So again, we're going to have a transfer student and first year virtual experience on August 4th. Um, August 11th is going to be transfer uh, focused, but also serve as the last minute for first time freshmen. And then finally, we'll have on August 14th, um, another transfer student and international student focus NSO. So we can pivot and do what we need to do to prepare for those more special student populations moving forward in the summer. But um, knowing that is important just to have these on your calendar. I have been in contact with Pablo and Cedric and advising leadership has as well. The schedule is going to be mainly the same as it was last year. So for those of you who were here last year, I don't think there are many significant changes coming to the NSO um, programming, um, but we will be beginning to have those meetings um, next week, I believe. So um, room locations have been um, solidified as far as I know. And so we're gonna move forward. And um, with that being said, my idea, for what we want to do this next year um, for NSO is going to be kind of playing off of what um, some of the resources that we've already been receiving, right? So it's going to be uh, basically a shared PDF. Susan, have your lunch up here. <laughs> um, we have um, a set of shared documents essentially. And so we're going to do a PDF that's going to include um, one pagers on um, day of processes, immunization and medical records holds, um, math placement best practices, particularly for our chemistry and math folks, um, LAC checklist updates, language courses placement, best practices for ASL, Spanish, Chinese, and Japanese, notable program changes, um, program requirements for honors, SOAR, and CHE identifying students, summer bridge programs, and special student population considerations. So I know that we're not gonna be able to, again, go through everything today, but just know that May 15th is our um, shooting for goal to have this shared document ready to go for everybody. So we'll have time to review it and get um, questions answered. And again, this is also gonna include um, points of contact and um, FAQs. So I am really looking forward to hopefully having that be a helpful resource for everybody to utilize throughout the summer. Okay, now with that being said, um, Dr. Vaughn is going to tell us a bit about 
working with our um, University 101 programs. Welcome, y'all. <laughs> um, I'm just sharing with them. I'm, um, I am not 100% right now. I'm not uh, contagious or anything. I think I got a hold of something bad last night. And so it's been a little rough. I was just sharing with them uh, last year for y'all's online meeting, I had COVID. So <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not quite sure what it is about this week in April. Um, but I definitely did not want to miss this opportunity uh, to come and, and share with y'all. Um, I really appreciate that McKay reached out to me for mm -hmm. one um, and to find out what we do. For those of you that have been here, I know that you're pretty familiar, uh, but for those that are new to our institution, our program here is fairly unique as compared to uh, this type of program at other institutions. So I do think it's important um, that I continue to inform people as they um, as they join us. So um, I do have, I do wanna do an overview. I do have a couple of handouts. Um, I'm not going to share the handouts right now because then everybody would be reading those. And so <laughs> I will hold off on that, but I definitely will go through and um, answer some questions. I do want to tell you a little bit about who I am. Sorry. Um, so I've been here at UNC since 2010. Stephanie Torres actually is the person who hired me and I worked for Stephanie um, until about 2016 as director of this program. I developed the program. Um, so I wrote the curriculum. Um, I do all the hiring and training of our instructors, our peer mentors. I wrote the textbook that goes with it. Um, 2016, uh, my position shifted to faculty in the College of Ed, Behavioral Sciences. And so now I am an associate professor. Um, since 2021, um, within APCE, but my role here is, is primarily as the director of University 101. I'm also the faculty trustee uh, for this past academic year, and it's likely that I will be the faculty trustee for this next academic year, which I really do appreciate that opportunity um, to be in that position because not only do I get to hear from a, a bigger purview of what's going on in our institution um, and being able to have a voice there. So the other thing to know about me is I am um, an educational psychologist. I got my PhD from the University of Texas at Austin, and my specialization is teaching and learning. And so uh, that is a big part of um, my focus. Outside of this program, I also uh, teach for the psych um, school um, for our future middle school and high school teachers. So that's another role that I have on and campus. And that's why you're sick, because you just listed 8,000 things. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, all right. So I do want to, and please interrupt me at any time if you have questions as we go on. Um, just to give you an, an overview, this is where I think some of the misconceptions come on. We are, it is a three credit research-based academic course. Many of these programs at other institutions are more of an orientation or extended orientation model where the intent is to share resources, build community, which all that's very important. And we do many of those things too, but it truly is to help students prepare uh, to do college level academic tasks. That's the way it's designed. A couple of pictures from last year. <laughs> So like I said, um, and it is based on the ed psych discipline. That is my discipline. Um, that is where the theories come from. Ed psych has you know, decades of literature and research that supports these things. So we do talk about goals, motivation, information processing, memory. They do read journal articles. We try to improve their reading comprehension and fluency, uh, write papers. We do a research project. We work through that process and then we also I'm gonna share a couple of uh, pictures. We also do a poster presentation to the university community. It is a practical skills piece, time management. Y'all know this, this is a huge issue for our students and especially our first year students. So not only do we talk about the theoretical foundation to it, but we give them practical tools then for them to actually work on those things, figure those things out for themselves as quickly as possible. This piece I think is important for y'all to know and many advisors in the past have told me they can tell when students who are in University 101 and those who are not because of the preparation that we go through this, we do not tell them what to do in their two or four year plan. We show them the resources to research that so that they can be prepared and come to y'all and then go, this is what I think it's supposed to be. Am I correct? Where do I need to make adjustments? And then y'all continue to give them that guidance. But we do walk them through um, all the resources around that. And then we pair it and partner with the career readiness. And then they do research um, on a couple of careers associated with um, their four-year their major. Um, we also, for some majors specifically, psych is one of them. 
We also have where they can research grad programs um, as a piece of that if they know they're going to go to grad school. And then professional communication, just practical things that first year students need to know, I think is important. These are currently um, who it is required for. So our Chase students, our Go On and Learn students, our undeclared students, now that's been a few years. Psychology was required last year for the first time and our online psychology majors. And this fall for the first time, even though we've had honor students in the past, they will be required um, this fall to take it as well. I'm sorry, that's <laughs> okay. Um, just wanted to highlight some of our partnerships. And um, we do bring in the library faculty to support our, those research processes. And um, we do a lot with the psychological services clinic. Um, we even offer opportunities directly to our students to use those services. And so um, they do uh, use a lot of them. Um, and then these others, the other piece I wanted to share with y'all um, and a couple of y'all can vouch for this. One of the things that we do is we are very proactive about what's going on with students. So as soon as we see that students are not attending, students aren't turning in assignments, we look up who are their advisors and we're reaching out. Melissa can attest to that. <laughs> you know, Flora can attest, we, we do not wait. Okay, so early on, um, we don't just wait for a progress report from Stephanie's office. Um, we're ongoing and continuing to do that. And if there is even some partnering that we need to do to help a student navigate some issues that they're doing, um, again, we're very, very proactive about that. Wanted to show you some pics of our research nights. We do this every uh, year now. I think it's seven or eight years now. Um, usually that week before Thanksgiving break is when we do it. And we'll do it two nights over the week. Um, I was actually at AERA, which is American Educational Research Association, um, last week. And I did a paper on Hispanic and Hispanic first generation students. And these were the pictures just from our last year of some of our uh, Chase students uh, that presented last year. But this is a big event, all anywhere from four to 500 students presenting their posters, research posters. Um, and we invite and encourage families, community and others to, to take a look. They're very excited. They're scared as anything those first couple of weeks when we talk about it, uh, but we walk them very carefully through this process. And ultimately, when they get to this, they realize this is really fun. They're very proud. They're very excited to, to share their work. Wonderful. Thank you. Uh, to know who teaches, um, it is our full-time doctoral students, usually in these um, uh, different, uh, something with education or psychology. I've had pretty much um, doctoral students from every college except for HSS because they don't have doctoral students there. Um, they do have to have master's degree. It is a competitive process and they get a large amount of training. We do 45 to 50 hours in the summer. And then they do, we do two hours per week concurrently in the fall. And so not only to give them support, but to problem solve student issues, um, talk about curriculum and things like that. So it also helps to make sure that students are getting a similar experience across sections. Mm -hmm. Another big piece of this is a very comprehensive peer mentorship program. So this is in my mind, our third population of students that we serve, primarily our first time freshmen, our doctoral students, and then a majority of our it's second year students. Sometimes they're um, second or third year, but their class leaders or peer mentors. Um, again, it is a competitive process. They're nominated um, during the freshman semester. They go through this process. We're finishing this up right now for next fall. They come to University 101 every day of the semester. Um, so they can share their examples, they can share how they've navigated this, how they maybe you face this particular challenge. Um, they also do a great deal of community building outside of class. They do, they will plan anywhere from 18 to 20 events over the course of the semester outside of class. So anything from showing up to the football game together, to doing study nights, to helping them prepare their posters or our research nights, all those kinds of things. Just some pictures of our events and our class leaders. Um, a big thing too about our class leaders, this has been very successful for them. I do have some uh, several empirical studies that we've published recently in peer review journals um, that shows the benefits to these students as well in terms of leadership, communication. And since we've started this program, all of these students have graduated. So I think that in itself is also um, mm -hmm. a testament to what's going on there. Absolutely. All right, now I will hand out, I have two here. Anybody have any questions about what I just shared? Okay, so I'll start one on this end, one on that end. <laughs> I 
One is kind of a more pretty one and one is more of a practical one. And I will also share these um, stuff with McKay. Um, and some of it will need to be updated. So this sheet is one that's a little bit more practical. The top part is a summary of what I pretty much shared with you. So there's a little bit more details there. The bottom here is data that not only talks about our retention, our graduation rates, our first term GPA, which is a critical one. You know, students on probation, it's very difficult for them to dig out. So it is one of those success indicators that I typically look at. Uh, the first row was part of the work that we did for the task force. So I wanted to share that. But the, the other four are from, um, again, empirical studies that I've had published recently in um, journals. If y'all want those studies or are interested in seeing those studies, I'm happy to share um, that with y'all. But it does show first term GPAs are one year persistence. Um, again, the one with our Hispanic and Hispanic first generation students I just shared um, this last uh, week, talking about 15% differences. Um, 18 percent differences. The one statistically very, and so the other piece on that. Thank you, Stephanie. There is some notes on the back here about how I do this data. That is the other thing. I am a statistician, so I am very careful about either using match control groups or I use covariates like high school GPAs, fall credits, those types of things. Um, so I, I am very attuned to the fact that people will say, "Well, just your more motivated students take this, so of course they do better." No, that's that's usually not what's going on here. So, um, so yes, I am very careful about the statistics and try to make this as rigorous as possible. It's also how I feel like I'm influencing the literature out there because m many of the studies in these areas have not been done well or have not been done with rigorous statistical methods. So it's another um, push for me. So take I'm definitely take a look at that. Um, on this back part is our schedule for this fall, and it is by the different um, groups and how they're organized. Um, I just gave this to Cheyenne, and so that's where you'll see some have been assigned, some have not. Uh, so I would imagine that that's gonna happen here um, the next few days. I will update this and again, share with McKay. And then I also post this on our website. So once I have the final um, section numbers and CRNs, I will update this, but I thought it'd be good for y'all to see and the variety of sections we have and the dates and times that are going to be available. One thing um, I would also ask, this I saw happen last year, um, banner screen for looking up classes, you know, stops at 10 and then people go to 20 and I would have a section or two that's left off on that next page and students weren't seeing it and they weren't enrolling in it. And you know, this is what freshmen are gonna do. They see a class is closed because of the cap. And then, yeah, and they just give up, right? So I highly encourage, we do have 24 face-to-face -face and one that's online. I highly encourage um, everybody just to go to the 50 and pull the ball up. Um, I will set the initial caps at 15, but know that, um, and that's mainly to spread out the enrollment, but know that as those things fill up, I will raise those caps. And at any time a student needs to get in a section and it's closed, all y'all have to do is reach out to me and I will put the student in. I'm not gonna not have a student take it because the cap is at 20 and it's filled. No, we'll have 21 or 22, whatever it is, okay? We've done all the way up to um, 35 students before. I don't think that's the ideal. I like to keep it between the 15 to 25 because it really does help uh, accomplish the things that we need to do effectively with that number. Uh, but again, this, this is not hard and fast. So students need in a section because that's what fits in their schedule. Um, I will definitely make that happen. Okay. Um, oh, I'm about to be good there. Love it. Yes. Um, 
I think that my, unless there's other questions, I think that's what I have. Yes, Stephanie. <laughs> that's what I'm in the front row. <laughs> <laughs> As you go forward, have you just, even if it's not published here, looked at high school GPA and enrollment in in this course and how their outcomes might compare to those? I'm thinking about, we have our less than 3.0 GPA. I don't have that form, I think. Sorry. Oh, so you do have that. Can you kind of, like, what's the sort of it? So just for the group. Well, and so... This is one thing that uh, in my research I've done too. I did get one manuscript uh, published a couple of years ago, still one of the most uh, frequently read manuscripts right. for this journal, where it compared our one, two, and three credit programs. And ultimately students benefit if they take these programs, big picture, right? But as we got to the three credit, we're talking about a rigorous, um, uh, ac rigorous academics um, and that kind of focus and support the people that see the greatest differences are those students who are typically at additional risk, which includes students with lower high school GPAs, many of our first generation students, right? Um, and so this is where we will see even just larger differences as a whole. Mm -hmm. um, we did one manuscript that we're working on right now. We did face-to-face -face during COVID. It was something I pushed for. It is something we did. Um, and some of the differences from fall to spring for our face-to-face -face for our exploring students was almost 30% differences in retention. It's, it's crazy. And uh, there were so many different things going on that contributed to it, but truly them being in our program, being face-to-face -face had a huge impact. So, mm -hmm. so I asked that because the advising leadership was looking at probation. And you said when with the probation, it's really hard to recover. We're in terms of attrition, when our students get on probation, if you look at any of those graphs, they're not being retained mm -hmm. in higher numbers. Then when the directors were looking at it, they dig they dug in a little bit more and they said, I'm giggling a little bit, but they said, our less than 3.0 DPA people are on probation and then we're losing them, which is why we have fares first. But and I think if we can see such significant differences in GPA mm -hmm. between a, a student who starts with a lower high school GPA, which maybe suggests they don't have the habits of mind, there's other things that go into that, but it is hard to, to fail high school mm -hmm. in, in a lot of ways. Um, it's clear, like the difference in GPAs between someone who has less than 3.0 and was in University 101 and those who were not, it's pretty significant. And so I wanted to point that out because mm -hmm. not only should Bears First articulate that, but a lot of times their relationships haven't been developed until after they're in their coursework and things. It's really helpful if all of the network understands mm -hmm. the potential impact of that as a retention strategy. Absolutely. And it was one thing, um, part of that same task force where that data, I pulled that data from, um, I did actually put in a proposal for yeah. recommendation even serve our students that are on probation um, in that spring mm -hmm. semester mm -hmm. if they did not take it in the fall. Um, we're not there. We're, we're, not there. we're not there. Coming. So, I will say uh, across the board, since I've been looking at this data, and of course there are some differences, but usually it's around a half a GPA point difference in that first term GPA. Um, and again, that is controlling for mm -hmm. other factors um, that go into play there. Um, so yeah, long term, this has been very consistent, um, but Students are successful when they participate for a variety of reasons. Yes, I know this is going to take us in a different direction, but we should look at the data because we do have majors that switch that were on probation. So they're in biology, they get on probation, they get to ours, and then in the spring semester, they're taken at University 101. So we right. might have a bit of data there to look at that. To see what's going on. Mm -hmm. To see if that's actually, you know, the people who actually have to take it. Right. Absolutely. Other questions? Oh, I have another question. <laughs> so, but it isn't an easy A class. No. And they see on the first day that you might have requirements that might be higher in some of their other LACs that they're in. Um, what are some things that your instructors are saying to students do so they so they can stay in that discomfort? How can we also kind of articulate mm -hmm. if you stick with it, don't drop the course, these are some things. You, just anything sure. you kind of talk about, because I know that you talk about that with your instructors, and we want to partner in kind of understanding. There's a fear factor here where sometimes students are like, "I'm, this is too much. I'm, I'm out." Mm -hmm. 
So one thing that I do, and I've shared um, when I have the opportunity to talk with students directly, regardless of this nature and things like that, um, we definitely have that normal curve of grades through distribution. Just like any other class, students are going to earn the grade, right? Um, it is not an easy A. Um, but the other piece of it too, though, is in the end, my philosophy is that college is hard, right? And we need to prepare them to do hard things. Now, what happens here, what's different here, is that there's a lot of hand holding going on. No assumptions are made about what they can or can't do. Mm -hmm. So like the research project, it's divided up in five different pieces where they're getting extensive feedback, written feedback, verbal feedback, one-on-one mm -hmm. -on -one feedback, right? So they're getting all of this feedback, even on um, like a goals paper. It's their initial college paper that they're probably going to write in any of the other classes so that's mm -hmm. due like the second week. They're getting a lot of written feedback. And that is also then where we can connect them to the writing center. So there's a lot of hand holding one on one assistance with that college level mm -hmm. academic tasks that they're not going to get in their other classes because professors will just assume that they know how to do these things. Two of the biggest things, takeaways that students will say when they've gone through this process is they go into the spring and the professors assign them a 10 page paper and they're like, well, I know what to do now. Mm -hmm. And I can handle that. Mm -hmm. The other big one is time management yeah. and, and figuring that piece out. And so, yes, is it challenging? Yes, but we're also very careful about the schedule and how things don't overlap and they're doing one piece at a time. The work is more frequent, so it looks different than their other classes because they're used to taking three or four exams and that's it. Mm -hmm. No, they're doing stuff a lot for us. But again, it's not something that is going to be overwhelming. Mm -hmm. um, and in the end, they need to be able to do this stuff, right? Absolutely. So, thank you. Um, are you is this course going to be required for the psych transfer students? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then um, have you seen a lot of transfer students taking this class? Has that been a variable that you've seen, like their ability to transition into UNC well? So we have had people in transfer and admissions, right? Um, at one point, partners say, can we have transfer sections? Now, do I think that they benefit from it? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, for one, going to um, a community college, going to a different institution and coming here, it is different, right? Um, even knowing our resources that we use to support them academically, our library, and things like that, that's all different. Building the community, feeling like they're a part, of it, right? It's all important stuff, right? Mm -hmm. And so we do get transfer students, but it was never, when I put um, just sections for them, they didn't get the support to get them in there. And so I didn't have the enrollment there. So I ended up just opening it up to any majors. Mm -hmm. We do across the board every fall and definitely in the spring have all levels mm -hmm. from first time students to seniors to transfer students. And one of the things that we'll do, like we have a senior in the spring taking it. They don't do a two year plan, four year plan. That doesn't make sense. Mm -hmm. They do things that make sense in terms of their career preparation, is it interviews, is it resumes, is it investigating grad schools, whatever. And so that's the other piece we try to do is adapt it for where our students are at. That help? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, yeah just to add on that. So and especially for like the site, it's required for the transfer students, which haven't been two years now. Um, I really push them to get like the site specific section too, because usually like as mm -hmm. educational psychologists, something like that is teaching it, the majority of them want to go to grad schools and like mm -hmm. they build them in. Absolutely. Yeah. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. like, I have to say, yeah, but maybe not a little bit more excited. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So I'm Dana. I'm the um, academic advisor for PDA Advance. And so I'm wondering what kind of experience you have with our PDA kids that are not our students. Right. So, and we definitely have them, not in large numbers, because they do have those crazy schedules. Um, what I tell when I'm working with them, what I try to point out is that time management is probably one of the biggest things that they gain from it. I also know that their LAC sometimes are flipped to where they're taking some of those things later, but they still need that mm -hmm. support around what I'm going to do in writing a paper for my history class and things like that. So um, I do think it's more challenging because they do have such a busy schedule, but I also think that it becomes more critical because of some of these other tools. Yeah, I really want to try to to part of the word sell this to my incomings this um this year. Mm -hmm. And I think that sometimes though it is a hard sell because it is it says right research based academic 
prep course. And these students are coming here because they think they're going to be actors and musical theater performers. And a lot research. of them will, right? Capacity. Yes. However, they're still here for an undergraduate degree. And mm -hmm. so, right, um, maybe some other language or or working with that. I, I would just be interested to hear more of your thoughts. Science and learning class is that fair? That would definitely it's, it's definitely science of learning, but I would say it is to help them mm -hmm. prepare them for their other college classes that they're going to have to take. Yeah. They're going to be required to take. And yeah, but they don't care. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> I'm just flat out. Right? Yeah. Especially my musical theater majors, they take most of their LACs in their third and fourth year. Right. So then I'm trying to motivate them to get through English 122. Yeah. And they're a junior. <laughs> I, I know. So I would say that probably the bigger management piece of it could be around the time management. Mm -hmm. How are you going to manage these schedules, which are only going to get, I mean, I do this with my doctoral students. I keep telling y'all schedules aren't going to get easier yeah. <laughs> as you move along in your careers, especially, right? Um, so the time management, I think, is huge, as well as then as the other piece I tell students, especially our foreign students who are hesitant and coming in, because one of the things that they'll also mm -hmm. tell me is that they have an advocate in an instructor and a peer mentor day one. Yeah. And they are there to support them. They have questions about anything. In fact, we reach out to them in the summer before school starts. So they have a question about what about the bookstore or my roommate is driving me crazy or I can't get this professor to respond to me. What do I do? Um, and so it's many of those things. And then for the mental health pieces, again, that proactive piece of our instructors, I mean, the dean of students know this well because we are constantly navigating some of those things for our students. So I think that piece might be a better step. Okay. I will add in that I am excited. I did submit um, an application to the LACs again. We were once in the LACs, and when they restructured it, it went away. Um, and so I got their feedback, and so I'm going to resubmit it, and I think it's very likely we're going to be able to get it into the LACs, not for this fall, because I'm going to submit it this fall, but for the next fall, which should make it a lot easier for many majors to Fall 24. Fall 24. Fall 24. Is it social media? Fall 24. Awesome. And I already talked to him about the changes I wanted to make, and the committee seemed very um, receptive to it. So I think it's a, it's going to be a real possibility. The last thing I'd add for like the selling it part um, is if you have students who have taken the class, like ask them what they got out of it. Mm -hmm. and just kind of makes it yeah. real. Um, just because, again, I have transfer students, right. so you know, mm -hmm. from 90 credits, you're like, why do I have to take the university? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, that's so great. Making sure, like, when I have students who were in that position, they're like, how did mm -hmm. that turn out for you? Mm -hmm. get out of this? Right. And, uh, when the, oh. Any others? I know when over the That's okay. Time. This That's the reason why we're here. Y'all okay. can reach out to me anytime. Yes. Um, Thank you, Dr. Vaughn. I'm not on contract in the summer, but I work in the summer. I am always around. <laughs> I'm available. I'm very responsive. Um, there might be a week where I'm in the mountains with my kids, and maybe not then, but otherwise, please do not hesitate. Again, I will do whatever I can to get students what they need. So please reach out. On your phone. Um, what's your preferred communication method? Email, please. Yeah, I know that. I know a lot okay. of Thanks, Tara. We're yeah. going to go ahead and get started. I'm going to pull your presentation. Yeah.